Please join me in prayer. Holy and gracious God, your word is true. And you are true. And your love for us is true. We ask that you would send your spirit upon this moment, on our minds and hearts, upon this message, that we would hear once again the good news of your great love for us. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Eli, Eli, or Eli, Eli, Lama Shabak Thani. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? I first heard those words when I was a senior in high school going to my first Good Friday service. I'd never gone to one before, and I was recruited. In fact, I was recruited the day of Good Friday. The Jesus who had to carry the cross in, got sick. And so they needed someone under the age of 30 who could carry a cross in. And I remember showing up there for the drama, and they put me in like a diaper. It felt like a diaper. And I had to carry a cross in front of everyone wearing this diaper, only a diaper practically, had these marks all over my body that was makeup and then I had to say these words which I had never heard before those were the only words now before that all the other words Jesus spoke people from the congregation shared but I had to say these words my God my God why have you forsaken me now when you think of the seven last words of Jesus All the other words are fantastic because there's hope involved. Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. That's a a gracious word that Jesus could have compassion on his executioners. Or today you shall be with me in paradise. What wonderful hope for a dying man. Woman, behold your son. Jesus' compassion for his mom, his compassion to take care of, of his mom I thirst Jesus who is the living water was willing to be thirsty so that he could give us eternal water it is finished a beautiful word that Jesus finished the work that was assigned to him and father into thy hands I commend my spirit Jesus giving his spirit up to God knowing that on the day of Pentecost God would give his spirit upon the church Those are all hopeful words that Jesus speaks. But that one word that Doug just sang, that one word I had to say on that first Good Friday for me, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? That's a strange word. I mean, why do we really have to focus on that that Jesus was forsaken in his death. Why do we have to look at the the agony of his death in that way? Why do we have to focus on the most vulnerable moment of his life? I mean, his death is awful. In fact, when I teach death and dying at, at Grandview, there's a paper that they have to write. And the paper is, compare Socrates' death to Jesus' death, And who had the better death? Jeff, did you have to write that paper? Yeah. (laughs) When students write that paper, though, no matter if they're Christian or not, they always side with Socrates. And I understand it. Socrates was an old man when he died. He was surrounded by friends. He drank the hemlock. Quick death. Done. Good death. Dignity. Then you have Jesus. Jesus is a young man. All his friends have abandoned him. And he suffers greatly. He dies without dignity. Why do we focus on that? Why do we focus on Jesus' death? Why not just sort of forget that word? The six last words of Jesus would have been so much nicer. But we have that seventh. 
And that seventh is a huge problem, not just because Jesus had to experience it, but we run into a genuine biblical and theological problem. And that is in the Old Testament, God promised his people, never will I leave you, never will I forsake you. Or in Isaiah, he says, can a mother forget her nursing child? I will never forget you. I will never forsake you. And so how can Jesus, who is one of Israel's own, how can Jesus, who is a son of David, how can Jesus, who has learned about this promise that God would never leave him, God would never forsake him, finds himself in the place where he is forsaken, where he cannot know where God is truly at? Is God's promise true? Can we count on it? But maybe we're looking at this statement from the wrong vantage point. Instead of looking at it from the promise that God made, maybe we should look at it for what humanity has done with that promise. Because if we're honest, we're the ones who ripped that promise in half. When Adam and Eve reached out to grab forbidden fruit, they showed what humanity would do when God came near. We would reach out, grab Jesus, and put him on the cross. When the builders of the Tower of Babel built a tower to reach the heavens, they showed us what humanity would do. We would build a cross to forsake God. When we have hatred in our hearts, we show what we do with people that we disagree with. Humanity would take Jesus And put him on a cross. Is it that God broke his promise when Jesus was dying on the cross? Or did we break that promise for God? Were we the ones who ripped Jesus in half? And ripped that promise in half? Is Jesus forsaken by God because God wasn't there? Or is Jesus forsaken by God because we forsook him? But can you really tear God's promises in half? Can we really undo what God has spoken? Well, Psalm 22 gives us an important vantage point. Because it begins with the words, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And then it continues with the kind of death that Jesus would undergo. But at the very end of that psalm, it ends with the words, to him shall all the proud of the earth bow down. In other words, God would vindicate the one who died. God would raise up the one who was persecuted. God promises will stand. And that shouldn't surprise us. Because God, throughout the scriptures, has a way of bringing life out of death, a way of playing the trick on us. God seems to always have something up his sleeve. For Adam and Eve, who took the fruit and then hid, God had a way of finding them. And to a group of people who built a tower so they wouldn't be scattered, God had a way of dismantling that tower so that they would And to David, who found himself in the valley of shadow of death, he discovered that even there, God was with him. Or for Joseph, amongst his brothers, he was able to say, you meant it for evil, but I meant it for good. That Friday was an evil day, but God meant it to be a good day. Friday. You see, even though we ripped God's son in half, you cannot rip God's promises in half. 
And that's why Jesus can have compassion on his executioners. That's why Jesus can give hope to a dying man. That's why Jesus can express love for his mother. That's why Jesus can be thirsty to give us living water. That's why Jesus knows that he's completed his task. That's why Jesus can give his spirit up to God. Why? Because humanity has done its worst, and its worst is not enough. Its worst cannot stop what God has in plan for us. Oh, we rip God's promise in half. But God put it back together. An ancient theologian said it this way. What Christ did not assume, Christ did not redeem. You see, when we were doing our worst, God was doing his best. Have you ever been tempted? So was Jesus. Thus your temptation has been redeemed. Have you ever been hated? So was Jesus. You have a place with him. Have you ever been lonely, afraid, without a place to call home? So was Jesus. Have you ever had doubts that no one um, loved you at all? So was Jesus. Have you ever cried when you were sad at the loss of a loved one? So was Jesus. Have you been ever so afraid that you shook? So was Jesus. Have you ever been forsaken? So was Jesus. And he experienced all of it. Every last bit of it. To redeem all of this life. And all of That's how a bad Friday can become a good Friday. And that's how humanity breaking the promise of God actually is put back together. To rejoice on this day, this good Friday, for we have a God who's greater than death, a God who's greater than sin, a God who's greater than our doubt, a God who's greater than our hatred, a God who's greater than our worst. And he's done all of it because he loves you. And you can't break his promise. Amen.